I'm very, very, um, uh, very honored that we have him here today to give us um, give us a, a wonderful survey of some of the great things that have been shot here in town. So I'll just pass it on to you, Emma. Thank you, Julie. Um, well, let me begin by thanking um, the New Mexico Highlands University Alumni Association and the foundation for giving me this opportunity. It's a real honor for me and I hope uh, everything goes well for your homecoming week uh, celebrations. I'm really happy to be a part of it. So um, we're gonna be talking about the history of filmmaking in Las Vegas. This is a very, very small talk about a very large subject. We've had, uh, we've been lucky in Las Vegas to have probably close to a hundred different movie and TV productions that were, have been shot here in over a century. So, um, so in approaching the subject, I'd just like to share a little bit of my thinking before I actually launch into the presentation. So uh, with a subject like film history, there are kind of two different filters we can use to look at, to examine somewhat critically um, some of this history. Uh, so one of the filters would be archetypes. And an archetype in a movie would be uh, somebody like a hero or a villain um, or a romantic lead or a comedic lead. Um, and I've chosen two, actually three archetypes to, um, to illustrate the history of Las Vegas filmmaking. Um, there are also genres which are stylistic categories of the different movies. So for example, some of the genres that we could examine if we wanted to the most popular, of course, in Las Vegas is the Western film genre. There have been lots of Western shot here. Uh, there are also horror movies, very few horror movies shot here. Uh, period movies, what we might call historical movies, romantic comedies, superhero movies, alien movies, sports, mystery, crime thrillers, spy movies, children's movies, ethnic movies, war movies, LGBT movies, adventure animation. You can see that the list of genres is growing as people develop new ways of expressing through uh, the film medium. So we could, for example, just look at the Westerns that have been shot here um, or just look at uh, romantic comedies, for example. Um, another filter that we could use is what I would call achievement. So if you think about the Academy Awards and the Oscars that they give every year, they give um, awards to the best acting and the best uh, performance by actresses. So we could certainly use that filter to look at, you know, what are the best acting performances in the Las Vegas movie tradition. We could also look at the directing We've been fortunate to have some fairly uh, great directors that have come here, the Coen brothers, of course, Stephen Frears, Billy Bob Thornton. There's a pretty good list of some very accomplished filmmakers that have been here. We could also look at the scripts. So as you know, um, there are original scripts and there are scripts or screenplays from adapted material. Um, I think probably the greatest original script for a movie here was probably Easy Rider. Uh, we've had some pretty good adapted screenplays, including, of course, No Country for Old Men, um, All the Pretty Horses, The High Low Country. These are all movies that were made from, um, from novels. We could also, if we wanted to, look at the cinematography of various movies. Um, and the costume design, for example. Um, I happen to think Hostiles, which was shot here very recently, featured some great cinematography. 
Um, the high low country, for example, had excellent costume design of Las Vegas in the 1940s. So anyway, those are different kinds of filters we could use, but I'm gonna use what we could call an archetypal filter. And so the, the title of my talk is actually Heroes and Villains in Las Vegas Film History. It really should be titled Heroes, Anti-Heroes and Villains in Las Vegas Film History, but that doesn't have quite the uh, rhythm that Heroes and Villains has. So if you give me just a minute or two, I'll see if I can share my screen and pull up the slide presentation for the talk. Okay, can you see those? Can you see this slide? Not yet. Let me try. Okay, now I think now we're good. We're seeing an E. Can you see that? We can see um, uh, a, a square uh, with an E in the center, a round square with an E in the center. Okay, let's see. Julie, that, that's just his profile for E for Elmo for Zoom. That's not his screen. Okay. Okay, so right now I'm looking at the slideshow on my screen, Julie. Huh. Have you shared your screen, Elmo? What's that? Have you shared your screen yet? I believe I did. Try again. Okay, you still can't see my screen? Not yet. Okay, I see it now. The little green button at the bottom. Okay, there we go. Can you see the slide? Yes, now we're good. Okay. Okay. How's that? Perfect. All right. Okay, so this is about heroes and villains in Las Vegas film history. And of course, you can see a, a movie still from the great movie, No Country for Old Men. That of course is Javier Bardem as the um, killer Anton Chigger in, in No Country for All Men 2007. This was a role that Javier Bardem won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. So we're gonna start with Romain Fielding and the discovery of Las Vegas for movies. The achievement of statehood in New Mexico in 1912 mirrored the astonishing rise of a new form of popular entertainment, moving pictures. Instantly and everywhere, Opry houses, vaudeville theaters, and just about any large room or auditorium were equipped with projectors 
to show the magic movies to enthralled audiences. By 1913, Las Vegas had been discovered as a filming location by pioneer producer and director Romaine Fielding, a tradition which has flourished for over a century. Las Vegas, with its remarkable natural scenery, well-preserved vintage streets, and a variety of looks, has provided the setting for dozens of movie and television productions, including the Academy Award-winning No Country for Old Men in 2007, and more contemporary television productions of Vegas and Longmire in 2012. Romaine Fielding's auspicious arrival in 1913 was preceded by another whirlwind celebrity tour by the notorious and legendary black heavyweight boxing champion, Jack Johnson, who fought Jim Flynn here on July 4th, 1912. In fact, the filming of the Jack Johnson fight was Las Vegas first big splash on the newsreel screen before Fielding arrived. So you see here a number of photographs of Jack Johnson in Las Vegas. Bottom left is a photograph of him at the train station getting first arriving. You see uh, above that photo, he had a large entourage of trainers. And there's a wonderful group photo um, of Jack Johnson and his wife and entourage at the train depot arriving on May 27th, 1912. Now getting back to Romaine Fielding, Romaine Fielding is an enigmatic, curious, and somewhat tragic figure. Tragic for the fact that almost all of his movies, more than 60 features, have been lost. The Rattlesnake, filmed in Las Vegas, is one of only a handful of surviving Fielding movies. In all, Fielding made about 10 features in Las Vegas during his brief stay here in 1913. So you can see in this photo montage, a large crowd of Las Vegans for the filming of The Golden God. In that movie, there were uh, battle scenes air featuring airplanes. You see Romaine feeling below uh, as a character in the rattlesnake in front of Springer Hall on the Highlands campus which was of course the main administration building. And upper right, a wonderful photo out of the uh, Las Vegas City Museum collection of Romaine Fielding in the center with a bunch of extras uh, during a film shoot. Las Vegans were dazzled by Romaine Fielding's six cylinder runabout car that could reach the unheard of speed of 70 miles an hour. For his epic movie, The Golden God, Fielding attached floodlights and a machine gun as props in the battle scenes featured airplane skirmishes that attracted crowds of thousands near Church Street in West Las Vegas. Many film historians lament the loss of The Golden God to a massive warehouse fire at the Lubin Studios in Philadelphia, as it was the most expensive movie at $50,000 to be produced up to that time. Oops. Fielding was acclaimed by his audiences and is appreciated now for his psychological artistry and also for his sympathetic though cliched portrayals of Native Americans, Hispanos, and African Americans. The Rattlesnake is a great example of these qualities. In The Rattlesnake, Fielding casts himself as the Mexican lover, Tony. Fielding flamboyantly interprets the Mexicano in a grand sombrero and embroidered vest, and ultimately bonds emotionally with the rattlesnake that saves him. Some of the strange acting seen in The Rattlesnake is Fielding interpreting a rattlesnake's behavior. 
Romaine Fielding may be described as an early film auteur. An auteur is a French word literally meaning author, but has special significance in cinema. An auteur is a type of film director producer who is also involved in nearly all aspects of a film production, including writing, acting, and cinematography. Among the most celebrated film auteurs are Charlie Chaplin, Orson Welles, Francois Truffaut, Woody Allen, Martin Scorsese, and Stanley Kubrick. Fielding was the Western Division Director and producer for the Lubin Film Company of Philadelphia during the days before Hollywood emerged when Thomas Edison and other studios such as Selig Poliscope and Vitagraph were competing and experimenting with feature films. The Selig Film Company is significant to Las Vegas film history because just two years after Fielding's production cycle of 1913, a major Selig cowboy star na named Tom Mix would make early Westerns in Las Vegas. The heydays of silent movies in Las Vegas. The most popular movie theaters in Las Vegas in 1913 were the photo play and the Brown theaters. On Wednesday nights during Fielding's residency, the photo play and Brown theaters offered, offered Romaine Fielding nights with premieres of the movies he had shot in town just a, just a few weeks before. The Rattlesnake, Hiawanda's Cross, and The Harmless One all played in Las Vegas with Fielding present in the audience. The two reelers played four showings per night as they were only 20 or 30 minutes long, accompanied by either Bistolfi's Orchestra at the Brown Theater or Simison's Orchestra at the Photo Play. East Las Vegas Mayor W.J. Taupert toasted Fielding at one, at one performance as he was given a bouquet of roses from the Las Vegas Commercial Club. In contrast to Romaine Fielding, Tom Mix was everything but an obscure film star. Mix rose to fame as a handsome, dashing, noble cowboy character, a classic hero figure that would set a, that would set a precedent for many Western actors to follow, such as Gary Cooper, Alan Ladd Jr., John Wayne, and yes, Ronald Reagan. In Las Vegas movie history, we see the modern manifestation of the hero mix created in the 1994 production of Wyatt Earp, starring Kevin Costner. Mix apparently rented a two-story stone house on Guyana Street which still stands next to an empty lot where some filmmaking took place. How Weary Went Wooing was, one am was among the first of many features, at least 30, that Mix and his company made in Las Vegas in 1915 and 1916 for Selig Poliscope. A typical Mix feature film, How Weary Went Wooing, was released in September 1915. Some of the other mixed film titles from Las Vegas include Bad Man Bobs, The Brave Deserve the Fair, The Range Girl and the Cowboy, The Girl and the Main Bag, in the Mail Bag, and The Girl, the Villain, and the Dog. How Weary Goes a Wooin is representative of the early experimental Western features pioneered by Tom Mix in Las Vegas in 1915 and 1916. The cast includes Victoria Ford, who plays the female lead of the new school teacher in town. Victoria would star in nearly every Mix Western shot in Las Vegas. Tom and Victoria were married in 1918, and their marriage was Mix's longest, lasting until 1931. 
With the early Tom Mix Westerns shot in Las Vegas, we begin to see the emergence of a more realistic, though romantic and melodramatic, portrayal of the West instead of the hyper-imaginative stereotype features epitomized by early productions like Fielding's The Rattlesnake. The legacy of Tom Mix in the Western anti-hero. After his filming exploits in Las Vegas, Mix remained with Selig until 1917-1918 when Selig went broke and they were purchased by Fox Studios who hired Tom and Victoria. Mix's success with Fox was meteoric and he became one of the great silent film stars of the 1920s, along with Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford. At one time, his weekly salary was $17,500. In his career, Tom Mix earned about $6 million, which is equivalent to about $400 million in today's currency. With Romaine Fielding and Tom Mix, the emerging new Western film genre witnessed the portrayal of the anti-hero and hero, a dramatic counterpoint that would play out over and over again in Hollywood and interestingly in the Las Vegas repertoire. Ironically, the hero and anti-hero dominate Las Vegas film characters with the villain appearing more regularly in actual Las Vegas history and recent movies. The anti-hero in film and literature or any creative work is a flawed character, sometimes comedic, sometimes tragic, sometimes a foil or sidekick to a hero, and sometimes the featured character. A classic Shakespearean anti-hero is Falstaff, the lovable, funny, often drunken buffoon who is dear to King Henry. In Westerns, maybe the greatest anti-hero is the nameless drifter of spaghetti Westerns, such as Sergio Leone's classic, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, played by Clint Eastwood. Now the anti-hero of Las Vegas film tradition introduced by Romaine Fielding emerges again spectacularly in 1969 with Easy Rider, where three anti-heroes and motorcycle riders played by Dennis Hopper, Peter Fonda, and Jack Nicholson explore the virtues and vices of American counterculture in New Mexico and New Orleans during the height of the Nixon administration. Easy Rider as an anti-establishment counterculture feature movie developed by independent director Dennis Hopper was a great success at the box office and ushered in a highly creative new phase in Hollywood. The old studio production system of contract movie stars and directors was dying and new talents such as Hopper, Francis Ford Coppola, Mike Nichols, Steven Spielberg, Sam Peckinpah, Martin Scorsese and others would reinvent the new, the new Hollywood motion picture industry once again. With Easy Rider, a revisionist attitude to the Western film genre, genre was introduced in shocking, jarring, and controversial movies such as The Wild Bunch, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Bonnie and Clyde, and the spaghetti westerns of Sergio Leone redefined the West in violent tones, later reflected in literature by the novels of Cormac McCarthy. Uh, 
So here in this montage on your screen, uh, perhaps the most interesting photograph to us is on the lower right. We see Jack Nicholson uh, coming out of the jail um, on Bridge Street in the Hitchcock building where uh, Tito and Mary's gallery is now. And over the so shoulder, you can see actual Bridge Street buildings uh, of the late 1960s in back of Jack Nicholson. Another great anti-hero in Las Vegas film history is played by Josh Brolin in No Country for Old Men, a 2007 Coen Brothers production that won four Academy Awards, including Best Picture and of course, Best Supporting Actor for Javier Bardem. Brolin is essentially a decent hard luck guy who gets caught up in a horrific drug deal gone bad. In No Country for Old Men, one of the greatest villains in film history, the sadistic and resourceful killer Anton Chigger, played to demonic perfection by Javier Bardem, roams the dusty landscape with pneumatic cattle plunger in tow. As Anton Chigger, Bardem is a modern and fictional interpretation of the ruthless frontier gunslinger, perhaps best personified in Las Vegas history by the Dodge City Gang, Billy the Kid, Doc Holliday, and Dave Rudabaugh. Of these actual villains, of course, many films and television series have been produced and more cinematic material remains to be developed from the incredible boomtown sagas of Las Vegas. During its Western boomtown heydays, especially from 1879 to 1882, Las Vegas attracted many fascinating and unsavory characters, including Billy the Kid and Sheriff Pat Garrett. Although many Hollywood feature movies have interpreted their story, including Sam Peckinpah's Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid and Young Guns, and most recently The Kid, the Las Vegas chapter of the Billy the Kid saga is still awaiting production. While well known with location scouts and directors for its landmark buildings and historic streetscapes, the more unsung back alleys and back countries, back country have appealed to contemporary productions. The spectacular high country of the Guayanas Canyon watershed served as an invasion camp for the Red Army in 1984, in the 1984 John Milius film, Red Dawn, where young Brat Pack actors, Patrick Swayze, C. Thomas Howell, Charlie Sheen, Jennifer Grey, and others stormed the streets of Las Vegas in haphazard guerrilla gear. In Red Dawn, the villain presence of the Russian army was foreshadowed by the actual U.S. Army invasion of New Mexico in 1846. So here in this uh, photo collection, uh, I think some of us who witnessed Red Dawn in 1984 remember the actual heavy equipment tank and artillery battles that were staged on Douglas Avenue. Uh, you see there on the top center, a battle scene on Douglas right in front of the old Tykert's uh, men's store. Uh, below that, you see some of the sets that were actually built on East Lincoln Avenue that were later blown up during the production. And on the top right, uh, you see two uh, Russian army uh, soldiers in front of the old um, center block, which of course collapsed about a decade ago. The 1990s, updated the Western genre 
with postmodern themes of loneliness, alcoholism, despair, borderlands romance, and drifting as portrayed in the 1998 film, The High Low Country, adapted from the timeless Max Evans novel. The High Low Country of Flatland Mesas in San Miguel County near Pecos was the perfect setting for a cowboy love triangle, triangle starring Woody Harrelson, Patricia Arquette, and Billy Crudup. In the, in the forlorn streets of Las Vegas was seen through a dusty faded lens of director Stephen Frears and seemed to hearken the fading heroic West of John Ford and John Wayne movies. The 2000 release of Cormac McCarthy's beloved book, All the Pretty Horses, featured the rugged San Miguel County landscape along with megastars, Matt Damon and Penelope Cruz and director Billy Bob Thornton. Unfortunately, this ill-fated borderlands romance, which straddled the frontiers of the American Southwest in Mexico was a box office flop. Director Billy Bob Thornton's three hour long final cut of a movie was slashed to two hours by Miramax studio head Harvey Weinstein and the heavily edited movie never achieved the poetry and rhythm of Cormac McCarthy's great novel. Two recent Westerns shot partially in Las Vegas offer, offer contrasting narratives of Western archetypes, the outlaw and the military man. In the 1982 film, The Ballad of Gregorio Cortez, starring Edward James Olmos, a Mexican-American ranch hand becomes a folk hero and fugitive outlaw on the South Texas frontier, successfully evading an army of Texas Rangers for eight days. In the ballad of Gregorio Cortez, we see a character play both roles of hero and villain in turn of the century, South Texas. The photo that you see on the screen on the upper right is taken in the plaza of Las Vegas. You see Edward James almost there. Looks like he's being arrested. But in the background, you can see the Veter buildings uh, on the west side of the plaza behind him. The 2017 revisionist Western movie, Hostiles, stars Christian Bale as a US Army officer grappling with his conscience in the 1890s as he is, as he is escorting an ailing Cheyenne chief played by Wes Studi back to his home in Wyoming. With Rosamund Pike as a widow whose family is killed by Cheyennes, this gripping trek through the dramatic landscapes near Las Vegas also offers the compelling exchange of hero, anti-hero, and villain roles among the three main protagonists. More recently, in the past two decades, Las Vegas has attracted high quality television productions, even as the classic Western themes have showcased contemporary heroic characters and some extraterrestrials. The biggest success has been the acclaimed Cowboy Sheriff series, Longmire, a six, seven, a six season TV series following the exploits of Walt Longmire and based on the popular books by Craig Johnson. Las Vegas stands in for Longmire's domain of Absaroka County, Wyoming, and to this day attracts curious tourists to see the filming locations. Walt Longmire's gruff, tough, and sometimes humorous character 
shows us both faces of the hero and anti-hero. Bridge Street and the Plaza make cameo appearances in the 2011 science fiction comedy, Paul, bookending Easy Rider in interesting ways. Both movies are countercultural buddy road trips. Paul's great cast of Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, Kirsten Wig, and Bill Hader all grew into major stars. And the movie features the surprising casting of Sigourney Weaver as a CIA villain. Alien invaders haunt Old Town Las Vegas once more in the current series of Roswell, now streaming on Netflix, with extensive scenes shot at local business Plaza Drugs. Now, with the coronavirus pandemic halting productions and the arrival of a major Amazon studio in Albuquerque, Las Vegas awaits the arrival of new heroes, anti-heroes, and villains of a brave new world. Thank you very much. Okay. That was great. Thank you, Elmo. My gosh. You, I mean, it just could go on and forever, <laughs> couldn't it? I mean, great stories. So, um, so yeah, if, if people have questions, we, we do have some time. And um, uh, so you can go ahead and unmute yourself. And um, uh, it's a great opportunity because Elmo knows this stuff so much, probably so much better than anyone else in New Mexico, maybe even the entire, you know, United States. So, um, if, if I could ask, so Elmo, this, this doesn't necessarily relate to the history of film in Las Vegas, but more so towards your history in Las Vegas. And my question for you, I don't think I've ever asked you this, is what really inspired you to open up the Indigo Theater for the community, uh, you know, Kiva closed down a few years before you opened it up. So what inspired you to want to open up a theater? And why do you think it's important for the community to have? Oh, well, um, when I graduated from college, I came back to Las Vegas the summer after and the, the Kiva Theater was there and it was closed down. And um, a few friends of mine and I, uh, we each threw in $500. We had five partners, we raised $2,500 and, and we opened the Kiva Theater. This was like 78, I think, knowing nothing about how to run a movie theater. So the good thing about that is you learn really quickly. And so I learned the movie business at the Kiva and uh, we, had a, we had a great time there. We, we uh, tried to show uh, really great movies, uh, foreign films, classic movies, and uh, we did have a bit of a, a local following uh, at that time. I see my great friend Tip Tolbert is here joining us from California. Hi, Tip. Um, Tip and another friend, um, John Schmidt, shot a, a movie here gosh, 79, I think, called Phoenix. And it was a black and white movie, 30 minutes long, about how Las Vegas was rising from the ashes and it was going to be, you know, rehabilitation. So I think one of the themes for me personally, Leon, is I've seen Las Vegas go through these cycles, boom and bust. You know, we're going through a great cycle now. I think we're on the up and up. And so, you know, to get to your question about why did I open the Indigo? Um, I don't really think you can have a great community without theater, you know, both live theater and movies. And so I knew that Las Vegas really wanted to have movies. We do have the drive-in, but of course that's only open half of the time. 
So I just uh, had this building that my family and I had purchased, the, actually called the Baca building. I studied it closely to see if it was even possible to have a theater in here. And of course, we could have a very small 50 seat theater. Um, but you know, it, uh, I just felt like it was, a, it was a great time to do it. And we've had wonderful response from the community. You know, it's been a great, uh, wonderful, fulfilling thing for me. Thank you. Uh -huh. Elmo. Um, yes. Given, given the, uh, the, the, the filter that you used uh, uh, of archetypal, uh, ar archetypal nature of, uh, of some of the, the movies uh, shot here, how would you how would you describe the uh, the archetypal nature of the city of Las Vegas and how that connects to the type of movies from an archetypal perspective that end up being shot here? <laughs> well, um, let me spin that in a slightly different way, Frank. Uh, once I was thinking about it. You know, Las Vegas, I mentioned a, a couple of movies that are kind of like invasion movies, right? Uh, Red Dawn is a great example of that. Um, I think some of these alien movies I mentioned like Paul and Roswell are another example of invasion movies. Um, and so I think Las Vegas has this very hometown, hometown feel to it. It's quiet, it's friendly and it almost lends itself um, stylistically to wanting to be invaded by some powerful force. <laughs> so, you know, I think we could have a great zombie movie here, uh, horror movies, you know, uh, something like that. Uh, to get back to your, you know, the question you were really asking, what type of archetypes do we attract? Um, you know, uh, I would have to say anti-heroes are the main theme. Uh, you know, really, uh, there's only been a few true heroes in our movie history and uh, very few villains. We've actually, as I pointed out, have had more villains in the actual history of Las Vegas. But the anti-hero, because it's a flawed character, because it's an interesting character, um, you know, I think that represents itself most in our history. You, you think of, you know, one of the great moments in our history is Jack Nicholson, right? Jack Nicholson really emerged out of Easy Rider. He became a major star after Easy Rider. And he plays this really flawed character. Um, but, you know, in this whole experience of him uh, joining uh, Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda, Fonda, he, you know, he begins to learn about himself in that movie. Hmm. So in a word, I'd say the anti-hero is, is central to our archetypal style here. Thank you. Any, any other questions that folks have? If there are no questions, maybe I could just end with a couple of observations. You know, people ask me in, in town, when are you going to open up? What's going to happen? what's going on with the movie industry. And certainly um, nobody really knows. I mean, the major studios, when you think of Warner Brothers and Disney and Universal, you know, they're, they're all, I'm sure, reinventing their business models now. Uh, they're, they're looking towards more streaming platforms. They're developing their own streaming platforms. 
And I think actually it's going to be a, a great opportunity for smaller independent movie productions to actually maybe get financed and produced now in this type of an environment. Um, you know, a lot of the studios depended on these huge tentpole blockbuster movies. You think of the Marvel movies, superhero movies, some of the Disney movies, you know, they really required um, full capacity audiences to, to make a buck. But I think now with um, the pandemic and how it's gonna change the industry, I think there's gonna be great opportunity for smaller productions to get financed and find their way to new audiences. So it's an exciting time, kind of scary for us movie theater operators, but I think artistically for the medium, I think it should be a, a real productive time coming up. Elmo, yeah. I would add that you're also going to see a deconsolidation in uh, movie theater premises that the big companies are probably going to have to let go of the smaller producing facilities, which will be taken up by entrepreneurs. And we may see towards that uh, smaller film, art film distribution uh, availability, many more films in smaller communities. I think you're absolutely right, Tip. I mean, it's, you know, it's not just the big studios, but the big movie chains, AMC and Regal. Um, yeah, I just, it's a scary time for them. I'm not sure what, how they're gonna emerge out of this, but I think you're right. Smaller films will find a, a, a new houses, as, if you will. I know. I think while everybody's found some comfort in watching movies on their TV sets, I think real film lovers will be eager to get back into a dark theater and see a, a large screen, even if it's a small film. We call that the theatrical experience, Tip. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I grew up with that and enjoy that with you. I'm looking forward to it. Thank and I so just much. bought a year-long subscription at Regal just before the theaters closed. Oh. Well, I guess I'm an investor and I'm going to lose my money on that. <laughs> I have a question, Elmo, please. Yes, Martha. First, let me just say uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, as I do all of your talks. Um, you mentioned children's movies being a genre that was shot in Las Vegas. Can you think of specific titles? No, I didn't, I didn't mean that to in, be included in the Las Vegas repertoire. I'm just giving that as an example of a genre. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. It, it'd be good to have a children's movie shot here. Yeah. That's another, you know, wide open, wide open area for local interpretation. Mm-hmm. Elmo, it's Linda Anderley. Hi, Linda. Wondering about the film festival that you were working on uh, last year for an October um, presentation. Are you going to continue to work on that? And what do we hear about the film museum <clears throat> in Mexico? Okay, so, so Linda's referring to an effort that uh, I was working on with a few uh, local business people here. You know, there's been lots of talk about a Las Vegas Film Festival for years, and we've never really uh, produced one. Um, so, oh, I was working with um, Jane Lumsden and Michael Peranto and Cindy Collins. And, and a few others locally. And what we came up with was to have a Western film festival. So you take the Western genre and we wanted to really explore that. And so we, we kind of look, looked at it from the very beginnings of the silent film era, which of course would include Tom Mix. Uh, we were looking at the classic Western uh, era, which was about 1930 to 1960, 
which of course includes uh, John Ford and John Wayne and you know all of those great movies. Um, we also looked at a period that we called uh, the postmodern West, which I described briefly kind of with the debut of Easy Rider. Um, the postmodern West, you could say, started around the mid 60s. You could argue it's still with us. Um, exploring different themes uh, related to the more, the more or less the modern West, you know, migrations out here, uh, different kind of crime, uh, despair, loneliness, you know, different romance. Um, and then we were looking at having contemporary Western features, not necessarily cowboy movies, but, but shot in, you know, the current more urban West. Um, so we envisioned a several day festival that would have about six different venues including uh, the drive-in, the Indigo, a few theaters at Highlands. We even wanted to do some outdoor screenings um, in the Plaza and Lincoln Park. But of course, uh, the coronavirus uh, stopped all of that. But we have the business plan. Um, so it's kind of sitting there waiting for the virus to go away and I'm hoping that we're still gonna be able to pr produce uh, a festival of that sort. I think also we wanted to present Western culture in, in conjunction with the films. Uh, and of course, Las Vegas has wonderful history of Western culture. You know, we had the cowboy reunions out here. We had some of the first rodeos out here, great ranches around here. So, um, that was our vision. It was a Western film festival. Um, the second part of your question, Linda, was about um, a film and TV museum. Uh, so that was another project we conceived of. We started uh, some preliminary investigation of some possible sites in Las Vegas that could have such a museum. We looked at the old J.C. Penney building but the building we really like is the old p &M headquarters down on the railroad, uh, which is a vast, vast, fabulous building that could house really two or three museums in it, including our city museum and a film and TV museum. Uh, we made some preliminary headway with p and um, to see if we could broker some kind of uh, donation of that building to the city but uh, that too was, was cut short by the coronavirus. So I'm hoping we can revive that, um, that goal when you know, we, things get back more to normal. Thank you, thank you. I see, is Re Representative Salazar on here? Tomas, are you there? Yes, I am, Mr. Baca. Thoroughly enjoying your presentation. Representative, I'm honored to have you part of this discussion. You might have just heard the, the little discussion about the New Mexico Film and TV Museum. Um, I'm hoping that we can work with the uh, incoming legislature and individuals like yourself to you know, make this a dream come true. And we want to thank you for all the help that you rendered us while we were developing our ideas for the film festival and for the film museum. Uh, Mr. Baca, you're more than welcome uh, for that. And um, listen, I, I do want to thank you. Um, it's people like you uh, and probably a number of the individuals that are in this audience right now that have the ability to think in creative in, in ways that, for example, I find very difficult to move myself in that direction. And uh, as I indicated, certainly Elmo, it was really my pleasure. Every time that I actually met with you or had a little bit of a conversation with you, just made me that much better a person relative to the issue of there are things that can happen in our community and what we actually do need in our community are individuals like you, Mr. Baca. But again, thank you very much. I. 
the hope that you just um, uh, shared with us is the same hope that I have. That in fact, we can do th big things, maybe in a small way, but big things in our community here in Las Vegas. And thank you very much for your work and for the colleagues that you surround yourself with in terms of trying to get these things, these things done. And also a sense that I have in you and your colleagues that you're not gonna give up on this. And sometimes frustration sits in, but I've never sensed that in you. Thank you very much, Mr. Baca. Thank you, Representative Salazar. That means a lot to me. Any last questions? Well, thank you all for, for joining this discussion. I hope we can have more um, interaction about our, our great uh, film and TV history here. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you.